Hello and welcome to Troubleshooting Zen Study and Practice number 48. And this month our question is, I've heard you talk about opinions being a vehicle for delusion. Will you expand on this please? So this is actually uh, uh, something that I was taught uh, very early on in my own training from uh, my own late teacher, Venerable Miyokyo Ni, um, also known as Master Dayu Miyokyo, uh, which is her posthumous name. And this was, uh, this was something that she would introduce when she was talking about the subject of the three fires. Uh, those who are familiar with the Buddhist wheel of life uh, will know that at the very heart of the wheel there are three animals uh, often shown chasing each other's tails uh, one is a cockerel uh, one is a snake and uh, the cockerel represents desire or greed uh, the snake represents hatred or aversion um, and uh, the third one is uh, the boar the male pig and the boar represents the third fire, which is delusion. And quite often, you know, she would say, you know, um, it's easy enough, you know, we call them the three fires um, in Zen. Um, and it's easy enough to see that desire can certainly be hot. Uh, and also anger, for example, can be hot as well. But delusion, um, that doesn't seem to be. And then she would go on to talk about our opinions and she said one of the things that certainly comes under that or goes into that category um, are our opinions. And just to say, you know, um, doctrinally, the Buddha said that the delusion um, is the delusion of a separate self. So it's the attachment to an opinion, the attachment to a notion that um, I exist as a separate um, and long-standing, even permanent entity um, apart from everything else and she said you know that our opinions very much come under those uh, categories um, for the very simple reason that they're mine um, these are my opinions um, and uh, uh, they are something that can I can certainly get very heated about as I'm sure we all agree. You only have to turn on the TV, uh, see you know somebody, somebody being interviewed on the news, for example. Things can get pretty heated. You get those sort of TV debates, don't you? Where you know, um, are you for or against the motion? And everyone gets very sort of heated. Uh, no one ever changes their opinion. No one ever says, "Gosh, I never realised that." Um, I shall recant and uh, adopt a new view. Because what happens is, of course, quite the opposite. Uh, they become, uh, my opinions become increasingly um, entrenched. Um, and there's, it's associated with a strong feeling of conviction. And that conviction is a felt thing. It's not, um, how should we say, a rational thing. It's not a logically induced thing necessarily. Although, you know, one's arguments can still be rational and one's opinions are rational. Um, but there's something additional to that, and and this is really what she was pointing to. So she was, she wasn't necessarily pointing to opinions being, you know, right or wrong or always wrong or something like that. Um, the content of the opinion um, was often irrelevant uh, when she was talking about it. What she was talking about it was uh, about and specifically was the feeling tone that is attached to the opinion. There is a feeling underneath that I am right. Um, and it's that I, which is the self, which is the attachment to the self. Uh, and basically what she was saying is that that feeling of I am right pivots on that strong sense of I. And this is why it falls under the category of delusion, as the Buddha said, the attachment to self. Um, hence, hence my opinions. And she used to give a good example of this. She, so she'd always suggest this, an experiment that we could try. Um, uh, this was back in the day when we didn't have mobile phones with you know recording software on. We just had old-fashioned tape recorders. Uh, and she said, get a friend who knows you well and knows your opinions well and uh, tell them that you're going to uh, um, you know, run this experiment. All you do is you switch the tape recorder on um, and set a timer for half an hour. And then you ask your friend to start making provocative statements. What she meant by that was that friend knows your opinions about 
politics or whatever, and um, to start making to start playing devil's advocate, basically um, being contrarian. Um, now. She said, the, the interesting thing is that both of you know this is a game. Both of you know this is just an experiment. But she says, the interesting thing is it doesn't matter because once the passions are stirred up, it very quickly turns, quote unquote, real. Um, the feelings are real. And the conviction is real. Um, and she said, you can feel yourself. You know, you know the person is sort of needling you and you probably laugh at first. Uh, but you begin to feel a little bit awkward and you can feel the energy coming up in the body because this is how the emotion shows itself. Emotion is um, comes from the same root as the verb to motivate. And to motivate means to move, um, to do something. Uh, and that um, begins with a physical uh, sensation. The emotions always first rise in the body, even if they're going to go straight up into the thoughts. The, the emotion actually does arise in the body, and that's usually signaled by some kind of tightness, maybe in the shoulders, maybe the, the hands clench, um, maybe there's a, a restlessness, you know, with a sort of fidgeting, uh, that sort of thing. Anyway, the, the energy begins to come up, but sort of one consciously knows that what well, this is a game, so I try to restrain myself. And then the friend says something that sort of, to me, crosses the line. And so I just think, I'm just going to say this one thing uh, back. And that's it. You know, it's like a floodgate opens and it all comes out. And it can get quite heated, uh, particularly if that friend is, is brave, um, you know, and, and bold um, in his or her assertion. So um, she suggested the alarm clock after half an hour and maybe a, another friend just to separate the two of you um, if it gets a little bit overexcited. And then she said, switch the tape recorder off and leave it. Don't listen straight back to it. Leave it to for a long cooling off period, she said, a week. Leave it for a week so that it's thoroughly cool. And then rewind and listen to the recording. And she said, it's the most sobering experience in the world to hear yourself. Your voice physically changes. She said, and this is what happens when the, when the fires begin to come up. You know, the body changes. We often grow. If you see somebody who is angry, um, they almost swell up. They become bigger. The the hands and the arms and the fingers become very active. And there's a jab, the jabbing finger syndrome. The eyes can widen and bulge. The face becomes red. You know, the heart rate obviously increases. One begins to, you know, um, one's temperature begins to go up. And... Uh, uh, one becomes extremely agitated and the voice changes you know it goes from the normal everyday voice and becomes strident it becomes powerful or it can become very high and shrill as well um but it changes and that's that's the signal that that, that is a signal that the passion is now taking me over um, and uh, she said it's a very very sobering experience and what's more on top of that as she used to say, quote, um, one hears one's own voice utter the most trivial banalities as if they are the edicts or commandments from God Almighty himself. And she said that is what's like a real slap in the face <laughs> when, one, when, when one hears that. I have to say I have not done this experiment myself, um, but I've certainly been in arguments um, and I've certainly heard my own voice change uh, and I've certainly heard other people change and all those other things that I've described. I'm sure we've all seen uh, that because we've all been angry. You know, at some point we've all been engaged in a, you know, in a row or an argument at some at some point. And it's actually it can be quite frightening, uh, the power uh, that goes into it and that feeling of conviction of I am right. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, people make a lot about social media these days, I have to say. Um, I don't go on social media um, because <laughs> it's it's. It's addictive. It's uh, and that's the thing about the passions that they are addictive. In one sense, I want to be provoked. It makes me feel stronger. 
you know, a strong opinion has such strength in it, and I normally feel so weak and uncertain, that I'm happy to swap my sense of uncertainty for that sense of certainty, you know, even if it's, even if it's nonsense, even, and sometimes even if it's dangerous as well, and that's, of course, that's the dangerous part, that is why, you know, the fires lead to uh, suffering, pain and suffering as well, as the Buddha quite rightly diagnosed. So, there is this so yes that that uh, experiment maybe if you want to try it um, with your mobile phone the recording device on there would work perfectly well i'm sure um you can you can give it a shot um but i'm sure most can probably even without doing it can see you know the truth in it and so what really happens of course is here why the reason things become so convinced and the the reason also the converse side that if one of my opinions is attacked I actually feel it personally, you know, there's a personal stake in it. It's not just a case that, you know, I mean, we all know this thing, don't we? Because people talk a lot about sort of disinformation and misinformation. It's always the other side who's, you know, misinformed. Um, never me, of course, um, which is, it's really hard. You know, it's really hard when the passions are up to self-reflect. Very, very hard. Um, bec and the reason for that is that there's a personal stake in it, um, what Nicholas Taleb called skin in the game. Um, my skin is in the game and, and therefore it hurts. It hurts to have my opinion pricked. Um, and why is that? Because I identify with it, because I'm so identified with my opinions um, that it becomes something that I just um, cannot tolerate it's like it feels like a personal attack and this is often why you know in those arguments that there's a a real hitting out i mean if you see people you know if it goes beyond a certain if it, if it really does become uh an angry argument you know people will get up and walk out i mean that's the equivalent of the fight or flight uh, the other thing is is that they start banging the table or they may punch the wall or punch the opponents if they're if they really, you know, uh, lose themselves, it's it becomes violent. It's as if someone attacks you with a knife, you know, or a gun. Um, it sounds ridiculous in the cold light of day, but you know, we we sort of all have seen it. And and even if one has not done it oneself, um, you know, uh, we've certainly seen it. And and perhaps the most common is really to withdraw. Uh, that's probably the most socially acceptable and probably the wisest uh, decision. It's certainly better than hitting out uh, to, to actually withdraw, usually with a good door slam uh, to punctuate it as well. So, yeah, this is so we can see that that identification of I with my opinion, uh, with that very hot opinion has, uh, you know, has has taken place. And so I, I feel it very personally when when I'm attacked. And so we might, we, you know, um, so part of the practice, obviously part of the Zen practice, therefore, is to learn to recognize this. And of course, this is all part of the, uh, the practice of working with the fires. And it may be, you know, not a bad idea to, in that case, to not overexpose oneself too much uh, to um, situations that quite often, certainly online, are deliberately provocative. Isn't this what's called clickbaiting? You know, where you see something and it's and it's something that, you know, you think, what? That's ridiculous. Notice the change in my voice. Um, and then you click through. Of course, you know, social media knows that. That's uh, one for the advertisers because they're the real customers of social media, not you and me. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just the cannon fodder basically for it. So if we ever wanted to know why it's a good idea to, um, you know, practice working with the fires and a little bit of restraint, well, that's, I think, is quite a good reason uh, not to be lining someone else's pockets um, by you know, one's own passions, but once one gets one further admired uh, into them. Anyway, uh, moving on. So, yes, this is uh, 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 this is something that, as part of the practice, we learn a little bit of restraint with. Um, you know, and we can make a conscious effort to do that. And you know, it's quite interesting to see what happens. You know when that happens. Um, certainly in the Zen monasteries, you know, one is literally not allowed to have an opinion. Well, 
way. Now, obviously, one does have one's opinions, of course, but one is not expected to voice them. And that's an interesting thing as well. You know, when you're in a community, you notice sometimes there are some people who who really feel almost a compulsion to tell everybody what they're feeling or what they're thinking. And if they can't do it verbally, then they'll do it through the body. You know, they'll throw shade um, or they'll withdraw help or they will, you know, the face changes and they just want to make sure that you know how they feel. And of course I do that too. You know, I want other people to know how I feel. And it's often happening quite unconsciously or at best semi-consciously. Uh, and by that point, I don't really care anymore. And that I don't care anymore, of course, um, doesn't have that clarity of heart, doesn't have that warmth of heart. Um, it's really, you know, everything. The, the, the humanness has been abandoned and the fighting demon or, or the hungry ghost um, has taken over. Or the miserable being in the hell realms, you know, why me? Oh, you know, I want everybody to know just how miserable I'm feeling. Um so yeah that's uh, uh the, th there's a practice of restraint that can apply a little bit in there to be able to declutch from one's opinions a little bit um and if things become heated well you know maybe it is safer to to withdraw sometimes actually it's interesting i i do remember um the carl gustav jung the swiss psychologist uh, making this point he, he he said um in connection with attending a lot of meetings you know of various boards and committees that he was involved with you know he'd say you get these heated arguments and there's always you know when you get a group of people there's always two or three people who are very vocal um you know and the rest sort of you know uh, uh, sit around but two, those two or three people would be very vocal and sometimes you know they, they sort of seize the floor uh, as it were and he said you know if he had a point that he wanted to make he said he he, he try and struck him strike a middle way which is you know he would find a way to say it to say his piece to make his point but then he said and then I retire to my estates he uh, and and what he meant by that was that he let go so as it were he put it out into the world and then well we would probably say in buddhism the rest is up to the dharma um it's not a case that he would then try and force using his personal force uh to force something through because he felt and you know i think again my own late teacher would concur with this uh, that if something really doesn't want to go it's not because it's it's wrong it might just be that it's not the right time for it. Um, and, you know, if it's not the right time for an idea, then, you know, it's it's not going to happen. And if I try and force it through, uh, the result can, could be far, far worse. And this is the thing. This is the thing about opinions, and particularly when an opinion is uh, fired up, is it becomes very narrow. And the long-term consequences are ignored everything becomes focused on just this one thing nothing else matters and and you know even warning saying but you know think of the long-term consequence no 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 mustn't think of the long-term this is this is too urgent this must be um and that is the passion talking and so you know we learn through this practice to be able to sift um and and not conflate uh between the content of the opinion and the feeling tone, the passion uh, that gets attached to the opinion because of personal identification uh, of I. And uh, this brings us really to, you know, another aspect um, of the passions and particularly their influence on opinion is that the, the passions are transformative. You know, the, the passions, don't forget, you know, as it says in the Northern tradition, the Mahayana, the passions of the Buddha nature the Buddha nature is the passions and the Buddha nature is the energy of life and life is endlessly creative, endlessly formative and endlessly transformative as well. It is constantly changing one thing to another. And so um, I remember going to uh, 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 a long time ago, I used to work in 
you know, what's called HR now, used to be called personnel. Um, and I, I went, to, this is in the 90s, I went to see a, one of these um, sort of charismatic business speakers, which were all the rage back in the 90s. I'm not sure if they are so much now, uh, but it was a real fad. Uh, and, you know, they, some of these books were almost semi-religious um, in the way that they uh, they were, you know, the way that, that they presented their ideas. Um, yeah, anyway. So I went along to, to one of these and, uh, you know, this, this guy stood up. He's really good. And I remember the first thing he did. The room, we're in this hotel room and it was packed. Uh, and I was there with a class um, of people who were studying uh who were doing some business training um, and we all went along together and uh, the first thing he did was he whipped out a 20 pound note and says who wants this you know and everybody went oh. we were all British by the way as you probably guess so you know uh, the old reserve sort of clicked in no one wanted to stand up and he did he said this about three times he said who wants this he just holding this 20 pound note up in his hand said who wants it in the end actually I got up and went and took it <laughs> I put that down to a few years of Zen training. Um, but uh, anyway, and then he sort of said, so you see, you know, um, don't be held back. Uh, uh, if you see something, an opportunity, go and take it, seize it with both hands, that sort of thing. And, you know, it was, that's how the sort of evening went. We, we, we had these sort of little, uh, uh, he, he, he would do these things and then, you know, there would be some little, you know, nuggets of... Uh, wisdom or whatever that would would come out after it. Um, I remember another thing that he did. He th there was a, a a woman who was part of my group who uh, was very tall, very elegant, and he he picked on her. He selected. Her, he said, "Oh, come on out to the front." So she came out, and she was she was one. She was um, um, she was a little bit shy, uh, but anyway, you know, she came and stood out at the front. And he turned to us and said, that, "Right," he said, "I want you to all stand up." Now I want you to give this lady a, um, a standing ovation for two minutes. And he stood there and timed us as we gave this standing ovation. Well, by this point, we were really getting into the feel of it and the, you know, the, the energy in the room, the, the, the passions, if you like, were the emotions were, were all raised in us. And we were having a great time. We loved this. And so, we're, yeah, 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 yeah. And he timed us for two minutes. And of course, the first thing that happened with her is that she, you know, went beetroot, um, and you know shrank in embarrassment but after about 30 seconds she began to straighten up and open up and her eyes became shining and this beaming smile even though she knew that it was contrived it made no difference um i can't remember what the conclusion was at the end of that particular one but anyway it was really fascinating uh, you could see this this transformation rather like with the recording and the argument. It starts off being contrived, but my goodness, you know, the emotions transform it into something quite real in a in an eerie sense. And um, she came and sat down. Anyway, the whole evening was sort of like this. And as I say, every so often he would throw out these sort of pithy little idioms and uh, aphorisms and so forth. And we all sort of, you know, we were all with notepad and pen. We all sort of dutifully wrote these things down, um, you know, with a feeling that these were really uh, great nuggets of wisdom. And um, then we went home. You know, it was great. We had a great time, a couple of hours. And I put my notepad on the table and went to bed and got up the following morning, had some breakfast and thought, oh, I'll just have a look at my notes from last night. And I read the notes that I'd written and they were the most banal, you know, that that sort of, um, the sort of stuff you get on motivational posters, you know, you're only limited by your imagination and all this sort of stuff. And you just think, oh my God. But the night before, they really did feel like divine, divinely inspired utterings. Um, and that was all down to the passion. It was all down to the emotion in the room. Um, you know, and I'm sure we've all had that experience, you know, um, saying, you know, in a highly emotive thing, we do, situation and we do something that's really out of character. And afterwards we say, I don't know what came over me. And literally that was the case. Something did come over me, um, as a result of, uh, uh, of that. So really sort of very interesting. You know, very interesting indeed. So, 
there we go. That's a, 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 a few thoughts around that. Maybe, you know, if we want to take a, a practical um, exercise sort of out of this, we might want to see if I can hold my tongue. You know, if, we're, if we find ourselves, you know, to, it's about Zen practice is often about finding opportunities to train. And, you know, if you're in a, I don't know, dinner party discussion or whatever, or you're, I don't know, with friends and they, they get heated about something, is it possible to stay engaged but not get caught up um, in the heatedness? Is it possible to go in and then step back from it? Or do I get caught up with it? It's fun, um, in one sense, if we don't let it go too far. Um, but sometimes it might just come down to learning to just hold one's tongue, you know. Um, somebody says something that I don't like at work. Do I have to, do I have to take offence? Do I have to react to it in some way? Or is it possible to stay with it, accept the fact that this person has this, has said this, and yet still retain still retain the ability to see the human being behind it as well or because one of the interesting things that happens with uh when, certainly with a person that whose opinions i don't like and if i really abhor them then what we what we end up with is a characterization the other person becomes no longer human and that happens very subtly but it happens very quickly as well they literally become you know, mad, bad, and dangerous to know. And uh, you know, I, um, I want to separate myself from them. There's, it's very difficult to connect with them, to connect with their human side. And that's that's, you know, we talk a lot about living in an atomized society. Uh, and we often feel that you know that atomization happens to us, but we contribute to it as well. Um, so, you know, useful to ponder that a little bit. Just one final thing, perhaps we sort of finish on finish on this. Um, something that I remember experiencing the first few times I went on retreat, silent retreat, and I went on silent retreat with people who I uh, um, I didn't know them. Um, I, I, I mean, we'd sat at the Buddhist society together, but I'd never actually spoken to a lot of these people. And then we went on silent retreat, and I would sit at a table with them. You know, by the end of a five day retreat, I I knew whether they preferred tea or coffee in the morning, whether they took salt on their food, uh, whether they ate fast or slow, uh, uh, what sort of things they enjoyed and the sort of things that they didn't, the size of the portions. You get to know all sorts of things about people, you know, and, you know, if you know that, that someone likes salt, you and when they sit down, you might pass them the salt or the person who, you know, doesn't drink water, you know, and after they've said no, you, you, uh, you don't offer them again because they don't drink it and so on and one begins to you know develop a, a knowledge about the people that one is with only one has no idea what they think one has no idea of their opinions who they voted for what newspapers they read at all it just doesn't matter one is just with their present humanity and and to get to know somebody that way first before you get to know their opinions sort of helps it sort of helps retain that awareness that they that even if they turn out to have diametrically opposed opinions to yourself that feeling of their humanity is is easier to to, uh, to actually return to and i think that's certainly something that's um becoming increasingly um, uh, 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 disappearing, you know, in in our current circumstances, where where it's much easier for us to retreat, you know, we 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 learn people's opinions, and then we either attracted to those that we share or retreat from those that we don't, and we don't have to look at their humanity, and that's uh, that's certainly something that I I think that more and more we actually need to to get back to. Okay, we'll leave it there. As always, if you have a question for troubleshooting Zen study and practice, uh, send it along to rinzai at thezengateway.com and if you mark your email, troubleshooting, um, and then it hopefully will feature in a future episode. That's rinzai, R-I-N-Z-A-I, at thezengateway.com. 
Until the next time.